Hi there, guys. This is John Evans. Welcome back to a new episode of Book and Spade, where we discuss all things in regards to uh, Christian apologetics. Um, I am here with a, a fellow Roman Catholic and great uh, scholar, uh, Ryan Grant, and we are going to be discussing all things, particularly with uh, Thomas More, Fisher, and the Reformation today. So, Ryan, pleasure to have you, and would you be willing to offer a brief introduction about your latest work, your research, and some of your background? Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, having me on. So I have a bachelor's degree in philosophy and theology from Franciscan University in Steubenville, which really doesn't mean anything, actually, as far as, <laughs> I, I mean, some bachelors are, are hard won. Mine, um, I basically spent my time in the university learning what I ought to have been learning in high school, but instead was trained uh, to kind of do what you want and what have you. And I quickly found out why that doesn't work. So then kind of retraining my brain throughout uh, university and then after university began doing largely what I should have been doing in university. Always kept playing with the idea that, oh, I'll go back, I'll, I'll get a master's degree, I'll do this. And then at some point um, during my, my translation work, a PhD told me, you know, don't bother with that. You're, you're uh, the one doctor at the University of Minnesota he said, you know, you could do that, it'll help you get in, but you don't really need to. You're already doing that level of work right now. And I said, oh, all right, I guess I'll continue. So uh, so the work I do is, is I run Mediatrics Press, which is a Catholic press in uh, Post Falls, Idaho. And what uh, we, our aim is, is to republish books that are, see a lot of people say, oh, you're, you know, you're traditional Catholic publisher. Like, well, by default, I suppose, because that's what's out of copyright, and that's the type of work we focus on, but that's not because we're trying to you know, only stay in that market. We publish books that I think Catholics today need on hit historical topics, lives of saints, the better ones that shouldn't have gone out of print that did, and uh, try to keep those somewhat affordable. We also do a lot of new translations, which um, was, that, that kind of started by accident. I taught Latin for a number of years, in high school and then I stopped and I said, you know, I bet I could, you know, since I'm doing all these, this book republishing, I could translate a book in, you know, a couple, you know, some of these smaller ones in a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, within that came the small catechism of uh, for Catholics by St. Peter Canisio. So yeah, that just, you know, really just a couple weeks, get it to an editor, someone else to look at it besides me. And uh, there it went. So that that's more or less how that, that end of things, the translation work. And then, um, I can't remember what inspired me to translate St. Robert Bellarmine's work specifically. I'd always wanted to do it because okay. of uh, conversations I'd had with priests and who didn't know Latin, but they wanted to know what he had taught on certain subjects. And so we'd gone over and I said, yeah, I should get those out, which, which was uh, actually good practice and good work in getting through the, I don't know, kind of learning the ropes as it were. And, and finding you know, your faults and, and, and strengths as a translator and growing and, and, and doing things a little bit better. Um, so, it, so that's kind of how I got started there. And then through that kind of academic work made, you know, got in touch with a lot of other academics and, um, you would usually send me manuscripts to start working on or other things say, Oh, I need this translated. And it's only in, you know, handwritten Latin from like the 17th century. Can you read it? And you're like, well, it's mostly cursive, but time to start reading up on some shorthand stuff. And so just gradually in all these things, I'm self-taught. And have continued to work on my own interests, one of which, of course, is, is principally the, the Baroque period, the, the late Renaissance period, and the Reformation, ultimately. And so, well, in, um, you know, I mean, not just in England, but also on the continent as well, the great monarchies in those periods. And so that's been a, a huge level of, of research. I, I have been and continue to work on a, a new biography on St. Robert Bellarmine, um, which trying to bridge between a popular level biography and yet still still be a scholarly work. Um, and so that's been holding it up because I could just, you know, plagiarize, half plagiarize this or that other book or, you know, translate half, you know, this one out of Italian or what have you. And But I actually want to do something that's legitimately a real work, you know, so that naturally takes more time. And uh, of course, COVID's kind of wrecked that because any place it's not digitized, I can't get to right now. So that's been kind of slowing that work. But um, I have a number of his works translated, St. Robert Bellarmine. And uh, since we're going to be talking about Fisher and more today, I should note that I actually do sell two, bi two excellent biographies of both. So uh, the, the best, most complete one in print is uh, this one by Reynolds, uh, St. John Fisher, Reformer, Humanist, and Martyr. 
And then finally, St. Thomas More, a great man in hard times, uh, both by the same author. They're very excellent biographies. They're primary source based. Uh, they're, so they're, they're not hagiography, but they are written about saints from a Catholic perspective with an eye to the actual, the history, the manuscript history, the best sources and whatnot. And that's brilliant because, you know, I think one of the, the facts that often gets swept under the rug is essentially when you're dealing with people like Fisher and Moore, mm -hmm. they were in the, as, as we know, hovering three feet or four feet off the ground, they faced very real struggles which feel very contemporary between the struggles between the parish priest, the bishop, and the laity, uh, difficulties with Rome, difficulties with essentially, um, you know, the monarchy at the time. And so these essentially were holy men who were also too, to some extent, I, I don't think they would have necessarily relished the term, but also politicians as well. Mm -hmm. And that seems like an oxymoron to our ears now, but for them, it was essentially their life. I mean, Fisher in an ecclesiastical role, acting as a shepherd of Christ at a time when views of bishops were very low. He was seen very reverently, as you said on many other podcasts. Of course, Thomas More, uh, largely through the, the semi hagiography of a man for all seasons, which I, I love, frankly. I mean, mm -hmm. stuff. But, you know, essentially maneuvering, like in the midst of people like Thomas Cromwell, I mean, you cannot get, a, you know, slimier than, than that, or, you know, Cardinal Wolsey, who mm -hmm. basically, uh, you know, had a sharp mind, but as to his heart and to his soul, it's a very, very different question. So, in terms of pivoting to arranging the scene, often, you know, people want to begin discussing the Reformation in England um, in isolation of what's going on in the continent, but you, you've done a lot of great work on Luther. And we begin with, you know, 1517. Of course, uh, the 95 theses were probably pasted on the Wittenberg door, probably not nailed on the Witting, Wittenberg door. But essentially, if you could set for us the distinctions between uh, the way the Protestant uh, Reformation or, or revolts uh, how that spread in places like Germany compared to England, and what was the the primary difference uh, before we get into the careers of primarily Fisher and Moore? The primary difference between the Reformation as it as it <clears throat> appears as the controversy breaks out in the continent, as opposed to how it breaks out in England, is largely the state the the state backs it in Germany, but not in England. And also the church is more corrupt in Germany than it is in England. And that's not to say there was no corruption in England. Unfortunately, there very much was. But the, I mean, really, all, there's always corruption of some sort. But the the reality is that the level, it was far worse in Germany with bishops that were prince archbishops. So so I, I suppose to, to backtrack, how did it get so bad? It's from two 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 sources, two twin evil fonts, really. So in order to fund clergy and the training of clergy in the Middle Ages and uh, you know, the efficient endowments of monasteries and other pious religious houses, you had a system which is called you know, holding things in commendam. And so a patron or various families would have a history of patronage of a given position, a church position. Basically, they would pay the bills. They'd pay the priest's salary. And out of that salary, you're supposed to, you know, do, you know there's various moral theology texts about what he's supposed to do, all of which are entirely irrelevant now because then the, the, there, there are no, no, nothing's held in commend on anymore. The priest just gets a salary for the bishop and there you go, uh, or a stipend as it were. So, but you know, mass stipends and benefices this is what a benefice is. And so you'd have, on the one hand, you have a lot of that going on. And likewise too, bishops have a certain amount of income in their diocese, but all often, you know, might be on various diplomatic things here and there. So it gradually, once the mold has been set that the bishop doesn't have to reside in his diocese, he can pay somebody else to do his job, that starts to become the norm, and scandalously so once you hit the 16th century. And then you have another problem, so that when you went into diplomatic service, whether it was for the pope or for a king or for some, some powerful uh, noble, um, you usually had to pay for your office. Whatever office you held in a state, you had to pay for it. Likewise, the king. The king runs the country on his whole budget. That is his budget, his personal stuff for trinkets or whatever he's, you know, he has to spend in matters of state. So likewise, it's the same thing for clerical positions. If you're a bishop that's in charge of um, this or that office in Rome for the pope or a cardinal or whatever, 
you have to pay basically for all your expenses in running that office, all the people, all the messengers, all the mail, and of course, feeding and upkeeping a household of servants that are, that are doing all these tasks that need to be done in the diplomatic service, which means uh, you've got to have some source of income. So you'll be named the bishop of this place and the head of this order, the protector of this order, and then a lot of the income starts coming to you. And likewise, and so of course, the more the, uh, the less scrupulous and more, um, let's say, money uh, pecuniary of church officials knew how to game the system and make all sorts of money out of it. And so one w of which was um, Albert of Brandenburg. And so he wanted to have several dioceses, and he wanted to get a cumulus, get all this, so it would all be rolled into one and, um, and, and maximize the amount of income he could get out of the place. And, and Pope Julius II, who is, of course, paying for uh, wars in uh, Italy, because during the Western Schism, while the popes were away, the local warlords and the, the big Italian uh, you know, mafia families in central Italy decided to play and took all sorts of territory to kind of be their own fiefdom and didn't pay any notice of the pope when they came back from Avignon. So now Julius II is completing what was begun under Alexander VI, trying to reconquest all these areas. So he desperately needs money for troops. And uh, he's also got Michelangelo coming in the fields, <laughs> the battlefields, uh, so demanding money in order to, you know, to get to work on the <clears throat> certain aspects of the Sistine Chapel to get it finished, because he just can't buy the lapis, the lapis lazuli, uh, which is the, the, the blue stone that comes from Afghanistan via Venice. And he would grind that down, it would give you these wonderful royal blue pigments. And uh, in other way, and he, de and he desperately needed more of that, and it was very expensive. And so, plus, he just needed money for his own uses. <laughs> and so, he, um, he died very, very wealthy. And this is part of what what gives him his wealth, part of it. Uh, nevertheless, so the Pope's got to pay for all this sort of stuff, and Raphael, and, and you know, all the all the the art projects the papacy is engaged in, making Renaissance Rome truly the cultural leader to beat out the Florentines. Right, that's the goal. So. Uh, so Julius, you know, gets these requests from Albert Brandenburg, says, yeah, why not? As long as I get the cash, you can go right ahead and do whatever it is you want to do. There's no consideration about the gospel of Christ. There's no consideration about the, the spiritual needs of the church or how people are going to feel about it. So all these types of things increase the consternation. And then you have Julius is out of money. And, uh, and I told the, I explained this elsewhere, but he's out of money and he needs to recoup it somehow. And there was a theological opinion that, you know, well, people, you know, the church could make it easier for people who had a lot of money, wanted to make a sacrifice, um, you know, and there are already pious bequests on wills and people dying, giving their land, so many of their lands to the church and what have you. So, you know, so this seemed to some people, oh, well, you know, the Pope is, of course, the owner of all the temporal goods, right? Well, if right. he decides to sell him, it couldn't really be simony. And this opinion really catches his attention. And, he, and Julius II's like, yeah. So he extends this, um, this bull uh, to, to allow indulgences over into uh, to Poland on the one hand and Spain on the other. Now, in Spain, you had this really great reforming cardinal, Cardinal Jimenez de Cineros. And he looks at this and he says, uh, no. <laughs> so he rips it up. It was not published. It was never allowed. So indulgences were never sold in Spain. N not in this scale or in this method. So um, anyway, so Julius II dies, and now you have uh, a new, uh, one of the sons of Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, Lorenzo the, the Magnificent from Florence. And well, now, uh, you know, he becomes Pope Leo X. <clears throat> and so one of the first things he does is he realizes how completely cash-strapped the papal offices are, and the money's going out faster than it comes in, even with the Alam mines in Tulfa producing Alam as one of the only places in Europe to get it without having to, you know, go to the trade going through Constantinople and from the Arabs. So, you know, he's like, oh boy, what can I do? So he sees what Julius II had done and some money comes in from that out of Poland. He says, you know, let me expand. I need some smart German to go preach this over in Germany. So he gets this Dominican named Tetzel. And of course, and, and the re now you know the rest of the story, if you know <laughs> I did get a Paul Harvey bit. Yes. He, um, 
and he preaches in a very scandalous way, things that uh, would have got him censured by a number of theologians in Rome, actually. Um, the, the, you know, when you make it, you know, some, Luther's 95 thesis has a ring about it that uh, you know, it's too close to the truth and various other accounts of what was being preached. He says, uh, you know, the coin and the goes in the cup and the, uh, the, the soul flies into heaven. <clears throat> and and that, those were things that were taken from the popular preaching that Tetzel was giving. And so it's no surprise that there was this the kind of a boiling consternation as the spiritual devotion of the faithful is also increasing. You have this thing called the Devotio Moderna. Um, and it was a, a movement, a lay movement of uh, ladies started in the Netherlands. And it's actually the uh, um, Thomas Akempis' writing Imitation of Christ was very, very big for them. Uh, is just a group of ladies to encourage prayer and good works, corporal works of mercy, and you know, working in the hospitals, things like that were also being done by reform movements in Italy, like the Theatines, and later even the Jesuits and others. So this was a, uh, you know, it had a, a big pull in this area, in, uh, in Brandenburg, in Saxony, in, uh, in Wittenberg, Erfurt, right? There's a lot of them. So this is a scandal all this stuff going on. And so to make it worse, uh, the Augustinian monastery in Erfurt has the right to, to commission indulgences. So Tetzel, because he's a Dominican, he transfers that right as he's preaching, all right, come on, get your indulgences, folks. And he transfers that right to the Dominican convent. So this ticks off the Augustinians, they're mad. And uh, so the spirit goes to Luther, and it says, I want you to look into this. And the fruit is the 95 thesis. Wow. And that, uh, which was given as a normal disputation. So uh, if we had a, you know, DeLorean time machine of sorts from the back to the future, right? And after Doc explains, never set it to 2020, <laughs> he'll then say, well, I want to go back to 31st October, 1517. I want to see the very moment that the Reformation happened. Let me see it. And you're like, okay. So you'd be sitting there waiting, 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 same building you see today, except there's no uh, mosaic of Luther and Melanchthon on the top of it. So you'd be waiting and waiting and nothing would happen. Then eventually, you know, towards the end of the day, clerk finally got around to it, come down, get, uh, you know, some glue and paste up the 95 thesis, because that's how you did it. And, and it was a normal thing. It was actually sort of a kiosk or a billboard, as it were, and uh, announcing events of importance in the city, because that's a place everybody's going to go. Everybody has to go to Mass on Sunday. So everyone's going to see things there. And so anything that was approved uh, would go up, including scholastic disputations. That's how you did them. Duns Scotus did very much the same thing on the doors of, of uh, Notre Dame when he announced his disputation on the Immaculate Conception. And anyone else taking a doctorate or putting out a, a big public disputation would do the same thing. And it was fun to watch, too. You see the doctors get out in all their finery and argue in Latin. And you didn't really know much about what they're saying, but it was just fun to watch. If, and sometimes you cheer one side or the other. Somebody would, you know, get a, get a sense of what was being said and, and say, start cheering for him. And then uh, other people, even though they didn't quite get the gist of all the scholastic uh, discussion. So that, that was what was designed to happen. So well, October 31st, 1517 comes and goes. All Hallows Eve celebrations uh, with cakes and ale and cider and uh, so many things and uh, procession to the manor or the cathedral, wherever, where you're going to get your, you know, your further cakes and ale and um, candlelit after Vespers. And then the next day, All Saints Day, Psh, done. Nobody knows what's coming next. 10 days later, Luther's students translate the 95 Thesis into German. And then it starts spreading. Now, now it's in the vernacular and people are reading it. And especially anyone in the Devotio of Moderna, anybody that's got it is seriously developed uh, religious life and is seeing the scandals of the hierarchy in Germany that is now so moved, they're like, wow, this is, you know, this is exactly great. And there's no, really not that much that was erroneous as far as Catholic teaching in the 95 Thesis. There's a few things, but the, the vast majority of it is Catholic. And Luther, even though Luther already holds certain heretical doctrines at this time, <clears throat> such as uh, salvation by faith alone, at the same time, he's not so much, you know, looking at himself as a celebrity, or as somebody of that great importance when he writes the 95 Thesis. It's just this normal course of disputation. And it, but it takes, but once it goes into the vernacular, it hits this popular vein and it goes viral as it were. 
in those times. So now Luther is this big celebrity and gradually this starts to, you know, spread, but he's still, you know, he's still Catholic. He hasn't left it. And as he sees how much it spreads uh, and how popular it's become, he gets a little bit more bold. So then certain doctrines that he knows are problematic, at least are they're going to be viewed problematically. He thinks they're right, of course, otherwise he wouldn't hold them. Um, such as faith alone, which he's already already believed since 1512. This is not a new thing he suddenly comes up with. Luther didn't suddenly discover the Bible as one of his little propaganda pieces, put it later, um, which would have been patently ridiculous to anybody. Um, and so, but, it, but it sounded good at the time he wrote it in the 1530s, and so he ran with it. Um, you still see it in certain books. Luther discovers this Bible and they show this nice bound book, which they didn't have in those days yet, you know, except for a handful of things. And, you know, um, it, it usually would have been scrolled. Meanwhile, in. he's teaching <clears throat> sacred scripture for years upon years and is already devoted. He's an Augustinian for crying out loud. He's, he's borrowing from Augustine's doctrine. And you know what else he would do? He would take his breviary, his, his uh, the, the, the monastic uh, hours, and he would say, um, basically, all that he would take two days and anticipate his breviary for the whole month. That way, he wouldn't have to stop to pray. He could keep, you know, writing and doing, you know, scholarly, uh, you know, commentary and whatnot. Which means that he's not living a regular prayer life. And in those days, you could do that if you had some some poll or some, you know, some task that kept you away, right? As as is the case of Luther, so he, um, you know, so he basically is living all day to just commenting on things. And not not keeping up a regular prayer life, and as a result, now is getting very scrupulous. And that's of course, and uh, you can see um, even the Oxford Dictionary of the of the English is the English Church or the Protestant Church, I forget. It's Protestant work, um, and they have an entry on Luther that that for, I think nails it pretty fairly with uh, all the you know, and it's a Protestant work by Protestants. So. But it, it gets a good view of Luther. Luther uh, was irreverent. He, um, you know, he, he did not suffer fools gladly, which is interesting. It's actually the same thing could be said of Thomas More, but he does it with more class. Luther yeah. swears like a sailor um, routinely. Uh, to, so notably, in fact, that uh, another Protestant, Henry Bollinger, said that, well, such language could be expected in the swine herd, but in, in the prophet of the German people, I'm not so sure. <laughs> 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 so, so just, just pivoting to England, like, because right. you know, we, we all recognize that Luther's personality was less than, how, how do I put it this way? It, the, the charisma of, of Luther is a very grating charisma. It, it is a very harsh charisma. Um, it's not a charisma that's based off of the kind of devotion towards the Eucharist that you see in more. Uh, Luther's understanding of, of consubstantiation rather than transubstantiation seems to really um, eliminate the possibility of Eucharistic adoration or more Eucharistic consumption, which of course becomes, for me, it's a hop, skip, and a jump away from then Zwingli, and then you get all the ways away from all, all of the trap. But pivoting to England, you know, we, you have less corruption, but you do have basically still Cardinal Woolsey working his uh, machinations. If you could present to us, what does the court look like of, of Henry VIII before the arrival of Luther? And how do we get Henry VIII, of course, being declared defender of the faith, right? With the, uh, the writing on, on the, the seven sacraments, the defense of the seven sacraments, to essentially um, being able to pivot so strongly away from that viewpoint earlier, just through the machinations of Anne, it, it seems more, a more, more or less Anne's father at the end of the day. What was the major ideological tipping point? Is it Cranmer? What's um, entering into the scene? The main motivator is, even from youth, Henry is used to getting his way. And, and once it was clear to him that he was no longer the spare, but now he was the heir when his older brother Arthur died, he was determined to get his way. And in some of it's a reaction against his father. His father, uh, Henry VII, is uh, very overbearing with, with the younger Henry. And uh, you know, he's purposely being treated like a child and not allowed to develop into a man. And, and Henry is very keenly aware of this. He uh, even tries to supplement this by hanging out with his father's enemies, the Yorkists, at the, jolting, at the, the tilting yards. 
and by so doing also makes friends with them. So when he does ascend the throne, there is no danger of a rise again of the War of the Roses and things because he's made these, but he's their big buddies, right? So nevertheless, so, but he's also raised, you know, to, to have a pious, faithful life. Uh, you can still find in the uh, British Library, yes, it is in the British Library, it's called a bead roll. And it's a manuscript rolled up and you would pull it out um, and, and it had your prayers in it that you would memorize and learn. Prayers essentially taken from, from the breviary, from the liturgy, from pious sources, the great medieval prayers of, uh, you know, if you'll keep your, your potters and your aves, thou shalt not drown. And there's even a little note written by his bed servant, you know, in, in, uh, and Henry writes to a master, uh, you know, if you'll keep me in my prayers and I shall keep thee in mine, you know, and so it, it, it's something to you know, that effect. And uh, it's actually a wonderful little thing to, to view. If I can find the link for it, I'll, I'll give it to you so you can put it up so people yes. can see that. Um, so that's, that's the, you know, the devotion of the English church, which had, uh, was uh, famed for its music and in which Henry loved even till his death. And it's yeah, also have, you know, fairly conservative in liturgy. They don't see quite the problems you see in the continent. Uh, liturgy is a very messy, noisy affair. And, you know, so some people would think of the Middle Ages, think, oh, everyone's so wonderfully pious, and everyone's thinking of monasteries and chant, Gothic, and, and all these things. Uh, that's not, very that's not Germany place. in any way, right. shape, or form. It's not even Spain at certain points as well. Right. And so, no, it's not. In fact, it's a very noisy place, even during Mass. And there are several Masses going on in different, in the larger churches at different times. And that's where everybody comes together. And so you have some talking and you have some discussion, animal trading, and because uh, you could be sure we're going to be here at this time because we have to go to Mass, just like with the notices and whatnot. So also with uh, trading donkeys. And as uh, one uh, friend of mine who's an historian, Philip Campbell, pointed out, the, uh, it's in the De Defectibus of St. Pius V, which is a document that precedes the traditional Latin Mass, the, the 1570 Missal, explaining what to do if there's a problem and what would invalidate a liturgy, what, what do you do if this comes up. And it's right, one of the earlier things in there. What do you do if an animal grabs the Blessed Sacrament and runs off and it cannot be found? <laughs> it says, you know, consecrate another. And this is a document in the Missal for the whole church, which means you wouldn't put that in there unless it happened at least frequently enough that it needed to mention. <laughs> and uh, things of this sort. That make great Monty Python skit. Yes, a right. swallow descends from the sky and just lifts the chalice. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so is, is it true, by the way, that Thomas More regularly attended basically as like an extraordinary deacon in his local parish? I heard that he basically not as a uh, deacon, but he did. He was present in his church. He did, uh, you know, participate in ceremonies. So he was born in a place called uh, the Barge, Bucklesbury, and it had uh, a church right uh, right across the way from it, and you know where where he was christened, and he was heavily involved there. <clears throat> Peripherally, later in life, he would be a um, when he had a, you know his big estate at Chelsea when he was Lord Chancellor, he still had a priest there, and that would you know say mass, and he would serve, and the family would all attend. Now, the the significance of this is for somebody of his station, even though he's coming from common stock, he's risen to such a you know, level in office where he's an important person, and there was this view that important persons did not mix themselves in clerical business. It was like beneath them somehow to go down. Whereas, I mean, you look at that with piety and you're just like, well, that's, that's like that. I'm right there exactly. where the right. are. Yeah. This is one of the greatest, highest things I get. But this is the attitude. And more bucks the attitude. He just does not care. He's more interested in our Lord and devotion and prayer. So more is raised um, also you know, very piously. His father, John Moore, is a jurist almost gets into a bit of trouble under Henry VII and gets, uh, for speaking his mind just a bit too freely, it was put in the tower. And uh, Thomas, the young Thomas More in his law studies might have followed him, except then Henry VII died. <laughs> and so there's a little bit of background for when uh, it happens when Henry's coronation uh, procession with Queen Catherine, um, you know, makes its way towards Cheapside. And Moore was elected by the, the under sheriffs to give a speech, a rousing speech, which he gave in Latin. And, and he declares, now is the end of our slavery. Now is the beginning of our freedom of a new golden age. And, uh, and he also depicts 
that, uh, you know, Catherine will uh, be fruitful in the mother of many sons. Wrong on both counts, unfortunately, in the end. You know, Moore was many things, prophet he was not. Um, but nevertheless, the book was dedicated to Henry. I don't know that Henry ever looked at it again. It's also in the British Library. Uh, you can see the, the um, actually wonderful Latin verse, too, that he wrote. Moore was more comfortable composing his thoughts in Latin than he was in English. And it was a, Greek was another study for him. He definitely loved Greek, and his father had to get after him because he would slack in his legal studies so as to, to, to pick up more on Greek. So he, he's, a, he's a lawyer and a jurist, and at the same time, he's also a, you know, a man of literature, letters, it, almost, almost two lives in a way. One is his, his legal work, and two would be his scholarly circle, which is made up also of one of the most famous humanists of that day, Erasmus of Rotterdam. And Erasmus, I mean, I'd love to go into, we just don't have the time, but he's one of the more famous humanists. He's also criticized corruption in the church with various biting satires, which were not always well appreciated. So that and the fact that Moore had seen politically, for example, what happened at the end of Henry VII's reign, and also even in Henry VIII, the early signs of it, of, um, you know, political corruption and, and how to, to, to speak freely what your mind is. Uh, in the face of a monarch who may not really be in the mood to hear it. So first thing he does is he composes a work on Richard III, and he writes it in Latin. Of course, necessarily, lest it got out in English, there could be more trouble. And it's a sensitive subject dealing with this <laughs> sensitive issue, Richard III, who had uh, allegedly, according to Moore in that book, uh, murdered the princes in the tower by having him smothered. So that is suffocated with pillows. Um, and it's one of those works that it looks toward uh, one of the great problems is subjects not being allowed to speak freely and the king being surrounded by flatterers. And then he shovels it, uh, doesn't finish it. And he just decides even in Latin, it's too explosive. Best not to get it. He didn't yet have his position in Henry's court. Uh, but something else happens that propels into his next literary project. So there is a, a complication, a whole bunch of alum which comes from the Pope's uh, minds and Tolka. All of them is very important because it binds the, the chemical dyes into wool and cloths and so that they don't fade when you wash them. And so it's a very sought after chemical because it's needed you know, to make, you, make the clothes bright and vibrant for a lot longer. And the, it, the Pope's minds are the best place to get it. And it gets seized in London uh, by a certain Duke. And you have the, the, the uh, city of London is mad that uh, you know, these Italian merchants have these rights to kind of skirt by their, their, their prerogatives as a city to impose these various importing duties and whatnot on it. So then the Pope is mad that this one English lord has uh, picked up all, all of his alum and, and he hasn't gotten any, uh, any of the money out of it. So uh, Thomas More actually gets picked because he'd worked on some diplomatic projects in the past to deal with this situation. And actually, one of the people he has to negotiate with is one Jean uh, Pian uh, Marie Cardinal Carafa, <clears throat> later Pope Paul IV. And yes. um, so, but in his younger period, where his severity had not yet overtaken his zeal, so he um, Erasmus met him, and even though Erasmus certainly you know had issues with him in theology and later on as Pope, he would have burned Erasmus, <laughs> Carafa. Uh, nevertheless, Erasmus said, if the church had more people like this, I would never have needed to write praise of folly, right? And he's probably not wrong, especially in this early period for Carafa. So Moore is then the point man, and he manages to square all the parties where basically at the end of it, everybody's happy with this arrangement, this very complicated legal arrangement that he had to work out. And so this comes to the notice of Henry. And Henry says, well, this is a guy we got to get on board. So then Moore is brought in for, you know, and eventually is prevailed upon to accept uh, in a position in the court. And then now he's working on diplomatic missions. Now he's in Flanders and he's back in the court as secretary of letters, all the time away from his kids, which pained him very terribly. You see it in his letters, not being able to, to be at home. So while he's in Flanders, he works on... Um, a, a, a kind of a concept that just gradually takes over time, and it becomes utopia, which on the one hand means nowhere. <laughs> and the, the main character telling you about utopia is this fellow named Hithilidae, which is Greek for keeper of arcane useless knowledge. The, you know, <laughs> learn these useless facts, like did you know that uh, 
you know, in, in the beginning of the year, like some, some obscure thing that nobody knows or cares about, right? <laughs> and, and the whole book is full of irony. A lot of people don't understand it. A lot of people make this book and, oh, this is calling for communism. And in the 19th century, various socialists did take the book, using it to argue for the ab abolition of class, the abolition of property, the abolition of other things. But that's not what the book is about. And that's not what more is about either. It's largely about people being able to speak their minds, people making a mockery of what everyone else thinks is important. So, for example, the people in Utopia, according to Hithiladay, they uh, have gold urinals because gold is so worthless to them. That's about its only use. <laughs> and so they, 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 they've come to this point, this, this fictional people have come to the, the furthest point that they could by natural reason. And to show that Moore does not believe these things you know, as far as like the, you know, the, the apparent- It's social... a literal philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And he puts himself at the end of the dialogue asking Hithalidae these questions. And so he actually puts himself just as the naysayer on this whole thing. And, and I don't know if that was to protect him or not in case Henry got Henry's ire, but uh, I know it was an instant success. Actually, it was so successful, uh, some priest read it and thought that uh, they should get a mission to Utopia ready right away. Not, not, because he completely missed the point. He didn't realize it was fictional. <laughs> um, I mean, nevertheless, there's all sorts of things we could say about Utopia, and it could take a, a good deal of time. But that's, that's the, the real gist of it. And there's no. even a painting of Moore with his chain of office, where it's on backwards in, in the painting. <laughs> Because it, it, to emphasize that, that idea of an utopia, of making a, a mockery and having a certain amount of irreverent humor over the things that everyone takes as sacred in, in the world that really aren't. And, and basically uh, outlining that, you know, our kingdom is not of this world. Mm -hmm. and, and having almost a very sacred, charming sense of humor, very much like C.S. Lewis. Right. To some now, out of curiosity, you mentioned on some other programs that uh, at this point, Moore's view of the papacy is shifting. Um, you mentioned earlier, him with Erasmus, Rotterdam, were suggesting at one point, correct me if I'm wrong, that initially they saw potentially the office of the Holy Father as a institution devised by man to keep basically the, the ship of the Church of State afloat. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas later on, essentially, through looking at the Greek fathers, looking at people, I, I presume, uh, like Cyprian in the West, uh, you know, figures such as Ignatius of Antioch, I, I presume, through John Fisher, he realizes that the authority of the Holy Father is one which is affirmed directly, not only in sacred scripture, but also to in sacred tradition. So I, I don't know if you could outline uh, Moore's development of doctrine, to use a very uh, John Henry Newman term, in terms of his own realization of these things. And two, uh, Fisher's role in his coming to know more, and then who Fisher is. Because I, I think most people, uh, like myself, who, you know, naturally, our first introduction to Moore was in popular literature, or in a work like Robert Bolt's and then for all seasons, where unfortunately uh, Fisher is often sidelined and sort of mm -hmm. uh, forgotten. Where where do you see the um, the parting of the ways for for more, and where do you see Fisher entering into the great drama or the story at this point? Mm -hmm. It's a good way to do it because Moore and Fisher were not great friends. They weren't enemies, but they weren't you know very close friends. They had dealings with each other in one way or another, but Fisher was 10 years older and ran in entirely different circles, even though he was very good friends with Moore. So Moore's circle um, would run around a number of prominent humanists and reformers in London, largely. And he, uh, you know, and so he was very much given to this opinion that the papacy was a human office, that it was a human institution in order to settle controversies which had been devised in the, in the early church or by the you know, common consent of Christendom and that sort of thing. And thus, uh, you know, they, they held to conciliar theory, conciliar theory that the council is actually above the pope. Now, they were unaware, as it was easily possible to be in those days, that uh, there were can canons in Florence and Lateran V which had condemned this view. But they didn't know it, because in those days, I mean, even your knowledge of who was Pope might be several years out of date, because of the, the, even in Italy, because of the distance and the time and, and communications. So who, who knew these things? Usually bishops and canonists and theologians. Moore was never a theologian, nor did he pretend to be, but he was a very well-learned layman, uh, not unlike Henry VIII. So he you know, was a, 
a student, he'd read the, the Summa of St. Thomas. He had spent some time at a Cartesian monastery, actually, you know, discerning a vocation there at one point. So he, you know, he's very well versed in theology, but he's not a theologian. Right. And that's actually an important distinction most people don't realize, because there's a certain degree of training, technical terminology of argumentation, style that uh, theologians engage in. And not fruitlessly either, as is often said, you know, questioning how many angels dance at the head of the pin. That phrase was invented in the 18th century, by the way, if anyone's wondering. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, no, no one's discussing that. And, and right. for me, it's a exactly. story. Thomas's uh, in geology, which I, I, I just think is just a rationalist, um, backbiting sort of caricature of, of medieval scholasticism. But I, well, I, I, so, oh, anyway, so Moore is convinced of this opinion by, you know, in, in his circles anyway. A lot of people kind of have this opinion. They would be obedient to the Pope, but at the same time, they, they don't see it as a divine office. Now, Henry is raised to see it as such. Uh, with the traditional piety that he was given as as a youth, as a young man, so he you know he writes that now you have Luther exploding on the continent. Luther has gone from uh, asserting various articles and he meets with Cardinal uh, Cajetan, Cajetan, and he expects this this condemnation or these arguments about law or other points. And Cajetan actually goes in a very simple point of theology, he receives Luther very kindly, and he says, "What do you make of this?" And it's a bull of Pope Innocent the Sixth where he, I believe, it was in the sixth, or was it Clement the Sixth? I might be mixing up which one was which. And they have a document saying that the the very passion of Christ, it, but the very shedding of His blood, was sufficient for the salvation of human of human uh, humankind. And in that, granted, yes, everything we're seeing are, are abuses right now with these indulgences. But when the Pope gives an indulgence, it's it's applying these merits of Christ to men for pious works. And surely you can see this, for example, Luther had no arguments against him. He was, oh, let me, I gotta come back to this. You know, he was, he was stumped, one, because he didn't get the treatment he expected to get, and two, a position that was very powerful and that he had a, a great deal to argue with. And of course, he never addresses that with Cajetan. Then he is condemned uh, by Pope Leo X, the next Serge Domine, and Luther's response is to burn the document and burn the whole corpus of canon law along with it. And, and of course, now he's also got a protector, the elector of Saxony, right? The very, the, the very noble of that, that, that runs that area. Now, there's a reason for this. The elector of Saxony, Frederick the Wise, he remains Catholic, uh, but he supports Luther ultimately because, you know, the Tetzel and the whole re regime of indulgences that have been brought in were competing with his relic church. So you notice Luther doesn't say anything about relics until Frederick the Wise passes on. <laughs> and then he's all off to the races about St. Joseph's pants. That's right. Which I'm so, just kind of like, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, of all the relics to attack, this kind of a softball. And I don't know. It's just, but it's, it's interesting. It, it, is it just me or is young Luther essentially... An, an, an individual who still has a lot of mainstays, or at least cultural uh, affinities for Catholicism culturally. And it's almost as though as he's doctrinally strays mm -hmm. farther and farther and farther away from the, the, the tree. I would That's say that of. his condemnation by the Pope, at least in my reading by him, his condemnation by the Pope and then the further condemnation in, in the Diet of Worms gives him more time for reflection. Um, Charles V, he was very young, by the way, just, just coming into his own as Holy Roman Emperor, as this is all brewing up. He calls the Diet of Worms, and as Luther condemned, but he honors the safe conduct. So the German princes then uh, you were opposed to Charles V centralizing policies, because he's the Lord of Flanders and Burgundy, just became Charles I of Spain, uh, Carlos. And now he's come over, uh, this Flemish, you know, noble grandson of Maximilian I, to come in and, and be the, you know, the Holy Roman Emperor. And he wants the empire to work the way it does in Spain, and it doesn't. So this is one of the, the great problems. And of course, he's got to put all his troops in the field. He's fighting the French on the one side, uh, and then he's fighting the Turks on the other, who in 1529 actually become very close to taking Vienna. So the, in order to, there's two different uh, groups he's got to keep set aside. So one is the nobility, because he needs them to put their troops in the field. The second is this core of mercenaries that were created by uh, by his, his grandfather, Maximilian I. So they were not created, but it was, uh, it was under his age as they came to be. They were called Landsknechts, and that word in German just means um, uh, foot knight. 
but they were kind of their own corps of mercenaries with high training and tactics and armor. And uh, so they were, they were organized in a special corps by um, one of um, Maximilian the first generals, uh, Martin von Frusberg, who's actually called the father of the Lands Connects. So as Luther gets going, the Lands Connects, there's a good number of them that go Lutheran. And so they, um, you know, so you have these Lutheran lands connects too, and they're all they're all going to get purchased and, and used and employed in war, as we'll see even fatefully in say 1527. We we'll get to that later. So anyway, the uh, so this is the continental situation shaping up. So Luther now is this time for you know to sit sit down under uh, you know protection from the government, as it were, and from the nobility, and get some soul searching, get some things written up, and so he gets some books that were already. Um, you know, in kind of draft form and now put out, and this is where he makes the definitive break, De Babylonica Captivitate, or on the Babylonian captivity and the church. And that wasn't enough, so he had to go further, on the abolition of private mass, where he declares that, uh, that you know, the devil told him <laughs> that, that the mass had to be abolished. He's very reverent in his humor there, and he makes various jokes about it. Um, he has another book on the abomination of the canon, of mass, you know, so he's coming out with it, all these sorts of things. It is flurry of, it's clearly marking his break from the church at this point. And one of the things like in, on the Babylonian captivity, he attacks the sacraments. He argues, first he argues that the baptism, Eucharist and penance are the only true sacraments. Then after some thinking, he decides actually that penance is not really a sacrament. So he gets rid of that one too. So now it's just pe uh, baptism and Eucharist are the only sacraments. And, and like you said earlier, with the loss of, say, adoration or the idea of piety toward the Blessed Sacrament, um, the, the Blessed Sacrament is not, for him, a sacrifice, uh, I guess he's rejected that now. And it's also lost that the development of something that should be worshipped and adored. It's rather something you receive to be nourished. And so the whole notion of the sacrament of the, t of the table, as it were. Um, you know, that the, the Holy Eucharist is given to you specifically as a sacrament. And its only utility is to be given as a sacrament in that, in, in the, that nourishing aspect like food, not to be adored and worshipped and glorified on its own. Because that would, even for Luther, that would be idolatrous, even though he holds it's Christ, because it's only Christ in accordance with the faith of the believers, right? And so that's, that's part of the problem. And so it's, it's really Christ is coming along in the bread to nourish you without any actual change or substance. And so anyway, so some of this stuff starts making its way to England in pamphlet form. And, and it's, the censors start noticing it and uh, Woolsey starts noticing it. But the, the bigger thing is that Henry sees the challenge. He says, hey, I can get myself on the stage because the problem for Henry, of course, is how to keep the prestige without going to war because going to war is too expensive. He already tried that. He had uh, joined on with um, Ferdinand, of Spain to try to you know make his way during the the Italian wars against the French and uh, Ferdinand disappears and Henry, Henry ends up footing the bill and it doesn't work out very well in the end the Count of Angoulême unites so much of the French nobility as Francois the first and the writings on the wall for Henry he calls Henry's bluff that uh, Henry had declared if the French go to Italy then I shall say and if not then I shall say uh, I'm the one who'll determine it because I because I, they've got to deal with me up here in the north if they do well, Francois says, okay, I'm going to go to Italy anyway and have an army to fight you in the field. So Henry has to come to peace, peace terms. And eventually they work these out, and it's a way to keep Henry on the international stage. Uh, the Field of the Cloth of Gold actually would have been the uh, 500th anniversary of it this year, except they didn't have it because of COVID-1984. Uh, so, um, uh -huh. But anyway, so... The uh, it's an incredible, sumptuous festival. Moore was there as well as uh, St. John Fisher, actually, uh, as, as Queen Catherine's chaplain. And it's a series of games. It's almost like an Olympic Games of sorts between the French and, and the English. And they set up uh, you know, tilting yards for the jousting. And uh, the English are, are, are winning at every level. And then Henry has to go spoil it by um, challenging Francois I to a wrestling match, which he loses. <laughs> Francois is just a little bit taller, <laughs> in, uh, but, but both about the same age. And they'll, they'll continue, uh, you know, as, as enemies and friends sometimes, frenemies, as it were. Uh, and true true frenemies at heart. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I love how they play that off in the tutors, where Moore basically just pulls Henry aside and gives him like a, a fatherly, fatherly lecture. Right. Historically, that would have never happened, but no. 
<laughs> yeah, no, 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 yeah, you could not touch the real person. I mean, that, that was one of those shows that uh, I could not watch it because at every level it was it was absurd. In in some of the, it's these American polishes not understanding, um, you know, the the way. It, the magic and the sacrament even of monarchy, of the, um, the the various dignities, the various customs, what you do around a king, even the closest people to Henry, the groom of the stool and whatnot, uh, they would never consider touching his real person. There, there. This was the you know this absolutely verboten. You wouldn't do a thing like that. But it's like other movies, like that more recent Pride and Prejudice with uh, what's her what's her name, Kieran Knightley, where yeah. um, Mr. Darcy comes into the bedchamber while her sister's recovering. No, no, that you did not do that. That did not happen in that time period in England. <laughs> that was that would have been considered such an affront to her dignity and honor. Um, you know, you wouldn't do that. So the uh, anyway, it is one of those things that the mist in Hollywood. Anyway, um, it's interesting though, just, just dovetailing from that briefly, and, and yet something like the Tudors understands the, the, the reverence and the respect of the, in a backhanded way mm-hmm. for even uh, the Blessed Sacrament and for right. at least the person of Moore and the, and the person of Fisher in character, whereas something like Wolf Hall, unfortunately, by mm-hmm. what's her face? Oh uh, gosh, name is escaping me. Uh, Hillary and, Mantle. Well, she's yeah, the author, yeah. authoress of the book. Who just makes Cromwell the, this this glowing protagonist? Oh, of course. Who is the most? For me, I mean, if anyone is despicable in this entire narrative, it is oh, absolutely. Cromwell. It's like Cromwell's a bit of a Joseph mystery. Goebbels, a protagonist. Yeah. Cromwell's a so what she's trying to do there. Cromwell's a bit of a mystery. There's just not a whole lot that's known about him. And there's things that show he was a very cunning politician. He was very clever, and he was very he was definitely Protestant, uh, or in those days what they called Reformed opinion, because you didn't say Lutheran around Henry, because Henry hated Luther for reasons we'll get into in a second. So the uh, so what Hillary Mantle's trying to do there, and I actually salute what she's trying to do. I just don't like the way she does it at all. She's trying to work a, a plausible historical fiction that would give you a, bi- a biography that was never written of somebody with where we're lacking a lot of the sources. And so I salute that type of effort. I just don't like what she did, namely making him this, this grand hero. Because it, it largely aligns with her particular sympathies of it. And, and some of it's implausible. Her treatment of Moore is completely out of the documentable history of his character um, and things of this sort. So anyway, so getting over to... Um, uh, yeah, out of the field of the cloth of gold. Um, Henry wants to get on the stage without going to war. And so Luther offers him the opportunity. So Henry, uh, you know, commissions writings from various theologians and Moore is the editor who puts them together. The book on the seven sacraments, the, the defense of this, the royal assertion in defense of the seven sacraments against Martin Luther. That's the title. Uh, they, they were much lengthier in those days. And he you know, he marshals all these various arguments and it's actually a very well-written book. It's clearly his work. Some people try to say St. John Fisher wrote it and that's largely because of the, the tradition coming from the, the Henry's propaganda in the 1530s, where of course now and then it was a big embarrassment because of um, his defense of the Pope. So they wanted to put it on someone else and they tried on more and more had to be able to, no, no, I had nothing to do with it as we'll see in a moment. And so they just decided to blame Fisher. So much so that in the 1580s, editors of Fisher's works were legitimately confused about whether Fisher had written it or not because Henry's propaganda had been so effective. But the documentation shows clearly Henry's working in it. It reads like the work of a well-written, a well-read layman, not like the work of a theologian. And when you read Fisher's works, the two are so completely different, you know he didn't write it. So uh, Moore confesses to Cromwell when he's accused of having written the book or, or bewitched the king in writing the book that he was merely a secretary, an editor, uh, moving papers around and organizing things. And one day he goes to Henry and he says, my Lord, I, I see here in your, your dedicatory epistle, this great defense of the papacy. And Henry's just all glowing about it. Oh yes, absolutely. What, what's wrong with that? And Moore is thinking, well, maybe you want to take that bit out. And Henry's, well, why? Well, well, you know, the Pope being a temporal Lord and, and ye, my Lord, being a temporal Lord, uh, it, will, um, it will look as if, uh, you know, you, you, might get, you, might regret doing it. you might regret doing it later. Plus, you know, what about laws in England and things of this sort? And Henry says, oh, well, who cares about that? I, I always, I'll always uphold the papal dignity. 
because it is true that at this period, Henry believes the papacy is a divine office, but more does not. More does not believe it. <clears throat> so the book goes out. Leo X is absolutely elated. And then, uh, you know, sends, gives Henry this title, which he did not mean to be perpetual, by the way. Uh, Fide Defensor. And that's why you see it on the English coinage even today, FD, Fide Defensor. And so that was given to, uh, to Henry. And the... Um, Oh, and so then they had a special occasion prepared and they, where they're going to have a special burning of Lutheran books, pamphlets, etc. Uh, in the St. Paul at St. Paul's Cross in London. And Henry is supposed to be there. And uh, St. John Fisher, who was very much the greatest uh, preacher in the kingdom, was tapped to give the sermon. And so and this is the first time that Fisher and Moore would have come into close contact with each other. Now, Fisher, to get his background, so he's about 10 years older than Moore. He was born during the Wars of the Roses in a city called Beverly. And it was a wool-making town up in, in, Norch, in uh, Yorkshire, and where they dyed wool and so many things. Fisher got a good education. His father died young, and his mother remarried. And his, his stepfather seems to have taken a very good care of him. We just don't know a whole lot about him at this period. So he ends up at Cambridge, and he, he was uh, very good at Latin. Um, and then that's, that's known early. And that was the key to education in those days, uh, pretty much until the 1800s. If uh, you knew Latin, that meant you were educated, irrespective of whether you're talking about a Catholic or a Protestant. Um, and Protestants were very much just as big as Latin. In fact, one of the greatest uh, Latinists in Northern Europe in the 16th century was uh, George Buchanan, who was the tutor to King James in Scotland. And so you know, diehard Calvinist Republican, you know, so, but, but he was very much the, one of the best Latinists about in the North. So it, um, it wasn't a Catholic thing just because the Catholic church and mass and Latin and stuff like that. It was the language of education and scholarship. It showed you were educated. So you would learn Latin grammar. So then you would learn how to speak logically in Latin. That then that's, yeah, you have logic. And then you ha would learn rhetoric, which is how to do all that. The other two very well. And then there's, or that is to sound very good while you're doing the other two. So then in Cambridge, he goes further and then takes his degrees in theology and becomes a priest. And again, not a whole lot is known about his vocation, but he must have had some kind of spiritual experience, some kind of uh, vocation and impressed his uh, superiors because they, they actually were able to settle what year he was born in based upon the papal dispensation from Innocent VIII allowing John Fisher to be ordained before the canonical age. So um, anyway, he was, uh, you know, some, at some point met the mother of Henry VII, and, and she was so impressed with his holiness, she makes him the, the, her royal chaplain. And Margaret Beaufort was her name, the, the mother of Henry VII, who yeah. could have been queen in her own right, and she steps out of the way for her son Henry. She heard mass several times a day um, when she was widowed. Um, finally, then St. John Fisher allowed her to take a, a vow of chastity. And she spent her time basically translating French spiritual works. Uh, she translated a missing book of Thomas Akempis uh, into English. And, you know, she uh, patronized the printing press and so many things. And so one of the, her big, uh, you know, things, we got to help, you know, reform preaching. We got to get pious works, pious preaching going. And so she, uh, you know, sets up a uh, endowment for St. John Fisher and certain others to preach all around uh, England. So he becomes this very holy personage um, that is just known by everyone for his preaching. And then he's made a bishop. And this was kind of a surprising thing. So he had no connections with the court except for his mother. So people said, oh, well, except for Henry VII's mother. So people say, you know, oh, the king's mother gave him his job. So Henry wrote very explicitly, Henry VII, and he said, no, it's rather because every time I've observed him, he is seen to be a good and holy prelate, and I need to do something to make up for the bad way in which I've ruled. And so appointing more men like this will be the way to do it. Well, he dies before you can make good on that. So Fisher preaches the funeral for Henry VII, which Henry VIII would have done well to listen to, but did not. Um, then he, Margaret Beaufort dies a short while later, and, uh, that, and then she left... Fisher a good deal of money. Uh, the sermons for both occasions are, are given in that book I have on Fisher, in case anyone's interested, like I mentioned, uh, by Reynolds there. Anyway. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and, and then, you know, particularly because having access to that brings us back to a snapshot where you see a whole culture whose mm -hmm. focus is the Eucharistic life. Now, granted, right. with a desperate need for reform, that is now. But the difference fundamentally being 
that even in the liturgical abuses, even in the cultural and political abuses, there's still, even in the heart of a fallen star like Luther or Zwingli or Calvin, there's still the faintest whiff or, or memory of what Christendom was before they hacked it. Right. So, the, average, the average person's life um, would have revolved, well, would have revolved around one, uh, getting firewood and fetching water. The firewood's always important because you're going to keep the, either the stew or the laundry going, whichever one. Um, so you always needed that. And then, you know, the, the, whatever trade that the father of the house did, whatever secondary trade the, the mother had to do in order to help make ends meet. And then the mass, the patron saints, the processions. These are the things that made the average life, whatever the Pope was doing in Rome did not matter to the average Catholic, not only in faraway England, but even in Italy itself in a lot of places. It really didn't matter. It was only in a more learned opinion where there was a lot of concourse between people in different countries where the news traveled. That's where you would have some knowledge on scandal over papal misdoings or Episcopal misdoings. And in this case, so Fisher comes into the scene as a bishop and he breaks all the rules for what bishops are supposed to do then. He, um, get, he sets out, first he makes a policy, no priest will work in his diocese unless he has ordained him. So he actually does. There's only a short period where he wasn't physically able to do that. So I mean, 41 out of 44 priests in his diocese, he personally ordained over the, the whole period of his episcopate. Then uh, he would actually go himself to preach. And people were surprised at that. You know, they have bishops don't preach. I mean, no bishop preached in those days practically. And he said, if I don't preach to the people, I'll be damned. And he has this wonderful uh, series of sermons on the seven penitential psalms, which is worth getting. You can find it for free in a much uh, more antiquated English. So if you're not good with early modern English, um, I believe Ignatius Press did a modernized English version, which was very good, um, by the way. In any case, you're worried about them changing something. They did not. Um, then, uh, so he would go into the houses to give last rites of people, even when, according to the early biographer, the house was so smoky, none of his servants could abide it, right? So Fisher is very much his reputation as being the holiest man in, in Christendom. It precedes him everywhere, along with his writings. Um, well, he hasn't quite hit the international stage with his writings on Luther yet, but he has on other subjects. <clears throat> and this has you know, really impressed people. His sermons have already been published and sent abroad in Latin. And then, you know, so it's no surprise, he did, had a very difficult relationship with Henry, though. When he was eight, he was meant to be Henry's tutor um, for Latin. Then, uh, when Henry was eight, that is, Fisher was his tutor. Then, when Henry is at 18, and Lady Margaret Beaufort, Henry's grandmother, dies, there is a big bequest of money that Fisher intends to use to build St. John's College, Cambridge, <clears throat> which is where he's going to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, train future seminarians and future you know, priests. Actually, the word seminarian doesn't exist yet because the seminary system hasn't been created yet. And Fisher basically does it in all but name, where he said there's special rules for the, for the college and uh, what's supposed to be studied and how things are supposed to go. I've got a friend, uh, Dr. Alan Fimister, he always jokes that it, uh, F Fisher, for some reason, liked SCOTUS, and he had questions of SCOTUS to be read. You see, and he says, see, that's what SCOTUS would get you. He wasn't a Thomist, and so that, that just <laughs> led, that led Cambridge off the rails, right? So it's a joke of his. The, um, but anyway, you know, so, so Fisher was very much at odds with Henry over this question of the money, and he had to fight very hard to get that money, but he did and Henry never forgave him. So Fisher never got really any big, any kind of plum jobs. Not that Fisher wanted them, but uh, even uh, appointments where he could have done a lot of good in the church, Henry was made sure Fisher would not get those. So uh, the person that does come up is one Thomas Woolsey. So Woolsey is an interesting fellow, and it would make it short because we've been going on for quite a while. He's the son of an Ipswich baker, uh, innkeeper. And He's always on the wrong side of the law. Uh, there's, there's records in, in the local um, you know, record office going back to the time where uh, Woolsey's dad is often fined or in, in prison for keeping an unclean house. In other words, he was running a brothel, <clears throat> is what that means. So, he, um, so Woolsey, to escape, goes to the free monastic uh, grammar schools that are offered, and he become, they recognize his intelligence and his brilliance very quickly. He learns Latin very, very well. And so he goes to university where he does take his degrees and he becomes a, a priest. And he's an almoner 
for the court working for Archbishop Warham, the Bishop of Canterbury. So Wolsey was sent by Warham in Henry's early days. Henry in his early days idolizes Henry V and Edward the Black Prince, and he wants to re-kick off the Hundred Years' War and be like Henry V and take it all over again and make good on those Eng that English title of King of France. And Warham is trying to put the brakes on it. We don't want war. We don't want <laughs> this. And likewise, Bishop Fox of Winchester, uh, of, um, was it Winchester? That's, was it, no, nah, maybe, yeah, it was Winchester, because then he dies and Gardner gets it. Um, anyway, so they, they're I trying to, they're part of Henry's privy awesome character, Gardner of all people, but. I uh, know, yes. <laughs> he, he's a, he, was, he was in Fox's circle for one reason or another. Fox was the patron of Fisher and other people, other projects that, Fisher was working on, but he, he's an odd fellow and he shows up in different ways in the sources. So uh, anyway, without but, going... But essentially like, because on one hand, he believed in the mass. On yeah. the other hand, he had big problems from what I'm gathering with basic right. So you, you kind of sit there and you're like, oh man, you're essentially... And Gardner went to Cambridge where there was a little group, uh, even though St. John Fisher was more or less running Cambridge and he'd founded uh, St. John's College Cambridge, there was a group at Cambridge proper, which was called Little Germany. And it consisted of Gardner, this other fellow named Robert Barnes, um, and you know a few other figures, um, and, and also one Thomas Crammer. So it's uh, later, uh, and it's in the same circle as Gardner, uh, and they're called Little Germany because they're mostly discussing Protestant teaching that was coming out from Luther and others in, in Germany. So anyway, so weighing it all back to Luther with Fisher's character, so he's the, definitely the best preacher in the kingdom. So he was tapped by Henry VIII to preach this grand sermon at St. Paul's uh, Cross where they're going to burn all these works of Luther. And unfortunately for Henry, he had got, he'd taken ill, and so he had stayed, stayed home. And he said so he wasn't present uh, for this occasion. So as Fisher was, uh, was preaching, there's a prearranged moment where then uh, after stopping condemning these various errors of Luther, he stops and says, now our king has written this book against the, the errors of Luther. And then Wolsey would hold up the book saying that everyone is cheering and cheering. And had Henry been there, it would have been a lot more cheering for a lot longer, probably. <laughs> Nobody wants to be the first one to stop. <laughs> but uh, anyway... Yeah. So, uh, you know, so this is kind of how this uh, progresses. So Luther sees this and he gets twerked off. So he writes his book in response to the King of England, um, which has a much longer title than that. And he calls him a dolt. He calls him a pig. He calls him a fool. Never addresses any of the King's arguments, actually. So Henry is uh, very mad about this in private, you know, but it's beneath his royal dignity to respond to a book like that that is so full of such nonsense and filthy arguments. So um, he taps more. And so more uh, is also really mad about this book. And Luther is just this, this knave from, from Germany writing this nut rubbish. So he writes under the pen name of one uh, William Rossius, who was, uh, there was a William Rossius who died on pilgrimage to, to Rome, an Englishman. So people assumed he must have written the book. They didn't know that Moore's authorship wasn't known until much later. And in this book, Moore descends to the same level as Luther, hurling insults and Latin cuss words and uh, inventive ways to say the S word and the F word and other things in Latin and uh, to see if he can outmatch Luther for it. So it didn't quite do the work. And it's a big embarrassment to Moore scholars today, actually. But it should, it's, 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 some of it's very witty, and, but it's also very bad in terms of its propriety of language. So uh, Henry had asked Fisher to write a book. And so Fisher wrote the defense of the royal assertion against uh, the Babylonian captivity of Martin Luther. And he also wrote a second uh, rejoinder to it, uh, the defense of the priesthood against, in, 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 you know, in defense of the royal assertion against Martin Luther. So, uh, in, so in here, you know, he actually quotes a, a good deal, but not, not the way he usually does. His later works against Luther will quote him completely verbatim. And then, you know, so almost the whole work is Luther's work plus Fisher's in the same book. Um, but here, you know, he's not allowed to do that because he can't quote these, these offenses against his king. He can't say them. So he is writing, you know, very, with a very clear mind as a theologian against the work of Luther. He has uh, on, on this question of the sacraments demonstrating from scripture firstly, and then the patristic consensus on the scripture, what 
um, you know, what was actually, what actually is the belief of the ancient church that Luther seems to appeal to as if he, he's holding the same faith. And in the net effect is he doesn't. And then of course with the papacy, that doesn't come in in this book. What happens is Luther writes, um, he writes more, he ignores Fisher because he realizes there's nothing he can say about Fisher. He can he attack Henry VIII, he can do all these things, but Fisher is known for being a holy man. And so it, just, it would just fall flat. So what Henry or what uh, Luther does, he just kind of ignores it and goes on. Uh, Fisher works on a book uh, that, which dresses all of Luther's theology. Uh, now, now, when I mentioned earlier, Luther was uh, uh, condemned by Leo X. Luther um, took all of the articles that were condemned in Exerge Domini and he reasserted them, plus some. And it was a book, The Reassertion of the Articles. Or, I mean, it's just the assertion of the article properly. And so Fisher wrote a book against the assertion of the articles, where he took each and every one. It's like 900 pages of the original. It's a massive undertaking. But it's also a good uh, tool if you, want, if, if you read Latin and you want to know what St. John Fisher's uh, theology was at almost any point, you can find it in that work. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic, you know, pre-Tridentine witness to the refutation of Luther. And, and actually some of it serves as the basis of Council, the Council of Trent's teaching on justification, actually. And, um, but for the more on that, you want to read a book called The Works and Days of John Fisher by uh, Father Edmund Sertz. It's out of print, but it's uh, still findable used, I think. Um, but anyway, so all, the, all this level of work, you know, raises Fisher's estimation. Now Moore reads it, and Moore is just fascinated by a lot of these patristic testimonies that he hadn't seen before or hadn't seen addressed in this way. And when he's done, he realizes Fisher had it right and he had had it wrong, that the papacy is in fact a divine office, that it was actually constituted, instituted by our Lord because this is what the Greeks and the Latins believed about. And Fisher, um, because you always have that issue well, using texts that weren't really texts of the fathers and things of this sort. Well, Fisher is the recipient of a good deal of scholarship and text criticism, being friendly with Erasmus and others. And so there's a, a good number of texts that were, in fact, uh, you know, uh, not trustworthy as far as their authenticity, which had been weeded out. So most of what Fisher is using. I mean, everything he's using in his own day was considered actually been by this or that father. So there wasn't, and, and without any kind of doubt or ambiguity about it, and I believe most of that still stands up to scrutiny, most of this is not misplaced. So uh, it's truly excellent work, and it's very witty, very scholarly, very above uh, kind of Luther's nonsense, where he just doesn't even answer the question. So that, but anyway, so then we moves toward the king's great matter, I imagine you want to all right, guys, uh, for time constraints, we will continue in our next podcast on the King's Great Matter, uh, when basically, finally, everything comes to loggerheads and we see the martyrdom of Moore and Fisher. All right, Ryan, it is always a great privilege and great honor. May St. Thomas More and St. John Fisher pray for us. What up, Novice, as always, and thank you for this blessed opportunity. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you.